we come to Cannes to uh, to talk about that amongst other things. But it's the it's the one that's going first of all our projects. It's a documentary series, a five part documentary series uh, for the BBC and um, and the rest of the world naturally. Um, and it's it's about language, uh, language and languages. Um, everything to do with it, really, that we can um, that we can cram into five hours. Obviously, you, you'd need 50 hours or 500 hours to cover every extraordinary thing about this this gift that all humans have. This this thing that is part of being human, like opposable thumbs. It's one of the clear markers that makes us distinct from other creatures on the earth, as far as we can tell. It's about language and. It, Language is the thing, the gift. It's what the the French have a good distinction with, long and parole. There's there's language that, that, that the structure, the thing that we can d all do. And there are there there there's this instance of it that I'm using now, which happens to be in English. You know, it's like there's there's chess. Do you play chess? What do you think of chess? And there's a particular game of chess going on at any one moment. And um, so language is, as I say, it's common to all mankind, and uh, and it's it's as mysterious as our origins, really. And so, so part of it will be to, to try and understand how it grew in us, when it developed in our brains. Was it the trigger that made us really the, the special species that we are, uh, which is a tautology, special and species, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, or you know, is it the cart or the horse of of, of our moving out from? Sort of Tanzania, Kenya, in, into the whole of the rest of the world. Did that happen at the same time as language? And how did the languages divide in the way that, the same, same way that our race is divided, as it were, from Caucasian to, uh, or, uh, into Caucasian and so on? And, um, and then there's all kinds of issues of language. Languages can be used for almost anything. I'm using it now to try and sell a, a documentary series about language. Uh, but it's also used to seduce, to flatter, to, to change people's minds, to whip people up, to, to, to cause frenzies of hatred or love. Um, and there's transgressive language, language of swearing and language of inappropriateness, as we've now called it, um, you know, taboo words and, and so on. Swearing in, in our culture, we, we take it, of course, because it's so deep in our bones that we are shocked by certain words, but they, they're mostly words that refer to parts of the human body that are connected to uh, excretion and, and, and copulation. There's, there's nothing reasonable about that at all. It's completely mysterious. And, and if you were an alien and you were looking down on the planet, you would say, now what are the things that this species does that are most shaming and appalling? What's about, they torture children, they kill, they abuse. So presumably words like torture and kill and cruel would be the taboo words because they refer to the disgusting things that humans do. The nice things they do is, well, they, they make babies. They continue their species in, in acts of love and um, spasms of joy. So those would be really good words. In fact, it's the reverse. You can say, oh, I was in the traffic, it was cruel, it was, oh, it was torture, and, and nobody turns a hair. And you're referring to the worst things we do. But, but just say a, a word vaguely connected to the, the lavatory area, and, and people go pink and say, how dare you talk like that? It's so strange. There's no reason for that. Uh, it goes back to, to Genesis in, in the uh, Judeo-Christian um, um, uh, culture. It is the first point about Genesis is, is, is the shame at, shame at nudity, shame at, uh, uh, at those parts of the body. Um, it, Adam and Eve didn't say, oh my goodness, we're naked, we must cover our noses or we must cover our knees, that they immediately went for the, for the areas that are to do with, with, with genital um, things. And so it seems to be deep dyed and uh, it's not universal. I mean, e even in Europe it isn't. It's actually quite hard to shock someone speaking Flemish or Dutch by using parts of the body. They just, you know, be like shouting, "You nostril, <laughs> okay, I'm a nostril," and same if you call them uh, anything to do with your private areas. They go, "Yeah, okay." I mean, they're sort of familiar with the fact that in our culture it's very rude. People have this idea that language degrades, that somehow it's less pure even within a lifetime, and that the, what young people say is somehow sloppy or is not good, or that there is a proper style of language. I don't believe any of that. I think it's complete nonsense. Um, I think I think one can speak elegantly and beautifully in almost any discourse. You choose but I think it's also the nature of English but other languages too particularly English because of its historical importance since really 
the 19th century when Britain was top dog all the way through America's uh, taking over of that mantle and the use of English as an international language of everything from aviation to the internet um, is that it is it is a mongrel language both in, in, it, in the philological sense in its origins of, of Saxon and Frisian and uh, Jute languages and, uh, uh, and obviously Romance languages, so, uh, Latin and Greek um, but also within that it's a mongrel Every time someone who speaks English opens their mouth, whether they know it or not, they tend to be repeating phrases from Milton and Shakespeare and Chaucer, but also from nautical and um, legal and gangster and criminal and all kinds of discourses, all jostling together. It's a little like, a, it's a little like London. London is a city where, the, where in the same street you'll have a 17th century building next to a 13th century building next to a 21st century building. And some people think that's impure. In France, for example, where they zone, you know, where Paris is incredibly protected within the périphique, um, and they have the old Grand Projet, but generally speaking, it's, it's a museum, and their language is the same, because they have the Académie Française, and, and, and they protect the language, because they see that as the right thing for French. When in English, we're much more organic, and it changes, and it is full of Americanisms, and full of Australianisms, and now full of all kinds of mixtures of that. I mean, it's very tempting when looking back to see something like the English of the King James Bible, and to say this is really as perfect as a language can be. It's got this this richness, this suppleness, this complexity, this directness, this poetry, the actual texture of it, the crunch of it, the feel, the rhythm, all of those things seem to us to be perfect. Um, but I tend to think a bit like um, anything that I like the present because it always contains all that past. If, if, if you're alive now, you've got the King James and the Shakespearean English and the Dr. Johnson English and the Dickensian English and the, and the Irish, you know, the James Joycean English. You've got all these things, plus you've got today's English. Whereas if you were in the 18th century, you didn't have the joy of what was to come. So I think, the, um, you know, there is, there is a, lo a lot. But, but looking at other languages, I, I've already done s some filming. We're not s starting till next month when I have a film to finish first. But I did manage to go to Hong Kong and Beijing. And I interviewed the man who invented pinyin, which is the way of what they call the Romanization, is the way of rendering Mandarin into... Roman letters so that it can be uh, uh, much more easily learned by the Chinese. I mean, that when Mao came uh, to power, there was 80% illiteracy, partly because if you see a Chinese character you've never seen before, you don't know what it, what it you can, might be able to work out what it means through the pictures, but you cannot say it because it's not phonetic. It'd be like having a new number. Someone said, this is a new number. And you say, well, what is it? I, how, how would I say it? Unless it was written out in letters, our phonetic letters, the Roman letters, are hence Romanization. You wouldn't be able to say it. And Chinese is like that. There's no clue as to how to say it. A Cantonese person will look at it and go ping, and a Mandarin will, will go pang, you know, I mean, it's just, or even zong or whatever. It's just completely different. Um, but this guy is 105 years old, and I interviewed him. He'd never been interviewed before on television. He'd been interviewed by journalists and newspapers. And, um, the first words he said to me were, well, you have to forgive me, my English is a little rusty. It's just astonishing, you know, this, this man has probably had more influence on, in, in language than anyone else alive, because within a very short time, he reversed the illiteracy so that, such that it was 80% literacy uh, and only 20% illiteracy, simply because of opinion. And what he could never have foreseen, um, that it, of course, it allowed Ch um, Chinese speakers to use... Um, the, the internet and, and texting and, 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 and so on uh, in, in a way that really their, their, their own language, beautiful and extraordinary as it is, just was not capable of, 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 of being used in that way. I can read German and French and Spanish and Italian and, bit of, uh, and sort of make, make my way through um, uh, Dutch and, and, a little, and a little bit of Greek because I did, those, I did ancient Greek at school, which is not very helpful for modern Greek, but at least means you can sort of read it and usually work out what's going on in a sentence. But I have no knowledge of languages outside Europe in, in, um, in Chinese or, or even Russian, which is a great shame. It'd be the old, you know, Shampanskiver or <laughs> Spasiba. <laughs> so, I'd, I'd, of course, I'd love to do more of that. If only there were time to, to, to do um, more language learning. But I enjoy it. And one thing I might... I'm setting myself the task... Um, 
uh, of trying to learn Esperanto for the purposes of this, because that's another interesting thing, is universal languages um, and made up languages. That's to say, you know, we can, they're a bit like Brasilia or, 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 or Milton Keynes are, are made up cities. You know, you sit, instead of organically growing in the way you feel a, a community should, they've been actually planned. And the most famous of those is Esperanto, though of course there are fictional ones that have become quite successful. The, the most successful at the moment is Klingon, of course, where there is a degree course, and as you probably know, and there, so I think someone's doing a musical in, the, in Las Vegas, uh, all in, in Klingon. I mean, it is genuinely, um, it's a genuine, you know, linguists have genuinely gone into it, and it has, it has the full range of, of, of structures, verbal structures and uh, uh, prepositional and pronominal scru structures that, that languages must have, substantives and, and all, the, all the very extraordinary things that languages need in order to express ideas some of them quite complex and the newest one is the one that's used in Avatar by the, 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 the people of that uh, uh, planet in, in, in Avatar which again and actually we're speaking to the person who devised that language because it's a very interesting thing to do uh, if only he, he only lived around the corner from here if only Anthony Burgess was still alive because of course he he devised a language too for um, a film called The Quest for Fire do you remember that which was like the early and he, he, he'd sort of devised a very early um, sort of caveman language, a sort of ugly language, as it were, which is exciting. Um, now, there's so much to, to think about in language, and the more you do, and there's language in, in art, of course, in poetry, and there's language in, in persuasion, in advertising, and in, and in rhetoric, and there's, um, th there's the way language um, develops, and, and, and I'm afraid there's language extinction, uh, as you probably know, almost at a sort of similar rate to the extinction of species uh, and so on. The biodiversity of the world's languages is under terrible threat. Uh, I was in Australia and, and talking to some uh, people, to a linguist there, as well as to a, 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 a member of an Aboriginal community uh, about the, the disappearances of their languages. I mean, there are a huge number of discrete and um, individual languages in, in, in Australia alone. And then you get real mysteries, like in, in New Guinea, there are thousands of languages. And you can literally have a valley where on one side they speak one language on, on, and on the other another, and those languages are not in any way related. They have no common ancestral uh, link. And philologists study them and see that they are utterly separate. Language also tells you an enormous amount about the human mind. About, I mean, for example, um, colour theory is immensely important in trying to understand. Um, the, 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 one of the most important questions linguists have faced over the past hundred years is whether growing up with one language that is your native tongue, your langue maternelle, as they say here, um, whether that alters the way you think, whether it has an effect on the way you think, on the way you see the world, the way you apprehend the world. The, it, it, it's, it's, it's called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which was, has been hugely rubbished over the last 30 years. It was, it was almost as fraudulent. But um, um, uh, um, um, a man, you know, a great a linguist in his own way, uh, but these days by academic standards something of an amateur who, who claimed that the Hopi Indians had no sense of time or no sense of distance or different senses of this and different senses of that and that it altered their entirely the way they saw the world because of their language and, and this became a popular idea and, and there's the sort of Orwellian idea that if you take the word freedom out of the language then you take the concept out of the language. Um, most linguists now don't, don't believe that and there's no evidence to suggest that if you're German, you're better able to express abstract ideas or philosophical thoughts than if you're Finnish, say. That the, all, all the works of, of Wittgenstein or, or of uh, um, you know, Voltaire can be translated into any language and an intelligent person can understand them. I mean, there are, of course, you see, this idea of a primitive language not having the same vocabulary, not being able to express things. And there, it's certainly true that we have, uh, in English, we have a, a massive vocabulary. Um, way larger than any other language by, you know, by really a huge amount but um, d d does that make us a more sophisticated complex people than, than, than the Norse or the you know, Sicilians or the uh, you know any of I don't think so to be honest I think you know the, the, the you know the culture in which we live the speed in which we the amount of communication we have which is a factor of, of, of technology certainly gives us 
new things and that's another thing that interests people enormously is is what technology is doing to language whether it's dumbing us down whether the abbreviations and uh, things that you referred to earlier are, are somehow cheap and coarsening the language I don't believe that and I would urge people to look at um, some of the, the greatest letters ever written in the English language by Lord Byron who was a fantastic letter writer and um, partly through uh, economy he was not necessarily the most uh, 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 economical person but um, he, letters were crossed and, and, and because they were ex very expensive to send, especially as he was a lot of the time in Italy and Greece and sending them to England cost a fortune by courier um, and, and they, they were to the number of pages and so he, he would abbreviate in exactly the same way that, that and for the same reason, paper was the, there was a lack of bandwidth, the bandwidth being the amount of paper you could send and, and so he filled it with as much as he could, crossing them. So you write like that, and then you cross, write the other way like that. So, so that you, and, and your would become YR, um, and so on. And, and just the same sort of thing, you just, just abbreviating. Now, was Byron illiterate? I really don't think so. Hard to find anyone more literate, in fact. The point is, you don't speak... You know, we, we can change our discourses as we change our clothes. You can't judge someone by the way they're speaking when they're speaking with their friends. Sensible people have, have, a, have a different language for different people in different circumstances. I swear in front of my friends. I wouldn't swear in front of my, my great aunt. It would upset her. That would just be rude. And similarly, you, would, you know, people who moan about political correctness, well, I, I don't think they'd use some of the words they use that are politically incorrect when in the presence of the minority whose word would offend them because it's just bad manners. And that's actually what it comes down to very often, this whole thing about political correctness or, or swearing. It's just good manners. It's, it's considering the other person. It's considering your interlocutor, you know, thinking about their, their feelings. That's, that's what being a decent person's about.